I'm Father Pullman. And I'm Father Schumacher. And this is A, A Closer, Closer Look. Look. Welcome back to another episode of A Closer Look. And today we're going to take a closer look at our topic of eschatology. We talked last week a little bit about um, the various things that are going to happen at the judgment, um, but we'd like to take a little bit uh, more time at the general judgment, this kind of recreation of heaven and earth. So, good place to start, Father. Revelation chapter 21, almost the last passage in the entire Bible when St. John sees the image of the new heavens and the new earth. Oh, this, this will be helpful then. It'll be helpful. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. All right, so there's some great imagery there. Um, when we now uh, per per perhaps maybe to get a little perspective on the, the image of the new Jerusalem uh, coming down from heaven, um, adorned as a bride uh, for God to dwell among his people. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons Christ gives parable after parable of what the kingdom will be like is because there, everything falls so short of what heaven will actually be. So, this is still veiled imagery, but we know something very real by it. So, um, one, we know that there is a new Jerusalem, which is not going to be geographically located in the, the Holy Land, at least that's not its origin. Uh, rather, it, it's coming down from heaven. So, uh, this, this represents uh, the divine institution of Christ's church. Not uh, in two senses, uh, definitively at the end, where and that's what we're focusing on today. Uh, but then Christ came and established His church in a way that is um, real, but uh, still has some the the, the final coming to to wait for. So, well, with this this uh, this heavenly uh, city definitively coming down, it will have no end. It's a a new Jerusalem, which means that this. Uh, at the end of time, those those who are living will, will all be faithful members of that city of God. Yeah, consider just how wonderful that will be. Um, as Father said, we have a church. We have the body of Christ, the people of God, right? He's already established the church. And yet, um, you know, of course, the threefold um, division of the church into church triumphant, church suffering, and church militant. The church triumphant is in heaven, already um, having the beatific vision, having completed their course on earth. The church suffering is in purgatory, members of Christ's body who are not yet ready, perhaps, for heaven, um, but are on their way there, right? They finish their course on earth, but they're not yet uh, admitted to that beatific vision. There's still some work of justice to be done. And then finally, the church militant, still undertaking the work. That's what militare means, to, to you know, be on campaign for God on this earth. Our lives are still ongoing. At the end, there won't be a church militant and a church suffering. Everyone will be in this church triumphant, this perfect society that God wants to give us. Now, he's already given it to us in, as you say, this divinely constituted church that exists here on earth. Um, but we also recognize that this church in time, um, in the, you know, subject to the different circumstances of the world, um, and especially suffering through many evils on this earth, um, is something that we look forward to the end of. We want to get to the rest of heaven, the church triumphant. We want to be triumphing in heaven. This perfect society already exists in that it has God for its head, it has you know a hierarchical or organization, it has everything it needs to be a society, but the society itself is not yet perfected. It is a perfect society in itself, but there's perfection yet to be done, and that will be accomplished in heaven. And this brings us to a little topic called um, typology, which is that um, things that exist now will be fulfilled by things that will exist later or that are, are you know, kind of the fulfillment toward which we're going. A case in point, the typology of King David, 
where it says in scripture that at the end of his life, peace was given on the, on the borders of the city of David. Uh, so Christ is referred to, especially in the Gospel of St. Matthew, as the son of David. And the definitive end, there will be peace on, on this new Jerusalem's borders. There won't be the conflict. There won't be temptation. There will only be that perfection of the society that you're talking about. Right. Remember that um, David was, was told that he should not build the temple. He wanted to. He wanted to build a house for God. He said, why do I dwell in a house made of cedar, but God dwells in a tent? And so he proposed to build a temple. And the prophet Nathan received a prophecy, and he told David that he should not build the temple because he was a man of blood, right? He had um, waged war, and you know, which was necessary, which was which was to secure the peace of the kingdom of God. Um, but it should be for his son, a man of peace, to build the temple, which of course Solomon did. And the name Solomon actually means peaceful man, right? Shalom in Hebrew means peace. Solomon is related to that word. Um, but Solomon was really a foreshadowing of the true man of peace who would build the true temple of God, which is in heaven. Um, God doesn't dwell in a temple made by hands. He dwells in heaven. Um, if, if I may, re recall what he said to his apostles that, that he was going to go before them to prepare a place for them. He was building the temple. So we're looking forward to that final consummation. We're not there yet. Some of the saints are indeed in heaven, um, although they don't have the resurrection yet. Um, they're looking forward to a consummation as well, um, to get their bodies back and rejoice with God, body and soul, as humans are meant to do. And so that brings us to the next point about that you brought up, um, that God will make his dwelling with the human race, right? God will be with them. Now, he has already done that, right? He came down from heaven to earth and became a man, dwelt among us, right? Um, and yet, at the end of his time on earth, he went back to heaven and left us behind. He said he wouldn't leave us orphans. He sent the Holy Spirit, right? But we're, we are looking forward to that reunion with Jesus, as it were. We have Jesus here. We have him sacramentally in the Holy Eucharist. We have him, as he says, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm there with you, right? We have him in these modes, but we long to see him face to face. And that is something that will be completed at that end time. Um, as I say, the saints already do see him with the eyes of the spirit, the eyes of the soul. But they, are, they, and we hopefully with them, will get back the eyes of our body. And we're going to get to see him face to face. Job actually uh, gives this uh, statement or declaration of faith that I, with my own, in my own flesh, with my eyes, I will see the living God. Right. That's the, the great um, passage that the, the great hymn line comes from. I believe that I shall see the good things of the Lord in the land of the living. I know that my Redeemer lives, right, is, comes from the same passage of Job, and I'm going to see him. This is something we look forward to. When we say in the Creed, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, that is something wonderful. It's not something, you know, the ancient Greeks had their idea of, you know, the, the realm of the heroes, right, which was supposed to be kind of better than just kind of the, the abode of the shades, right? And yet... Um, they recognize that their conception of it, what they had to look forward to without knowledge of the resurrection or of Jesus Christ, um, was not something that, that uh, was really satisfying in the end. Um, in fact, some of the great heroes are talking in some of the great works of Greek mythology, um, Greek um, epic literature, right? And they're talking to each other, and uh, the one of them who's already died is meeting, I don't know exactly how it works, but he's meeting with one of the living, and this living hero says, oh, well, you know, you're, you're considered a hero. Um, you must be kind of doing well down here. And he said, I would rather be a slave on earth than to be a hero in the underworld. Um, the Greeks understood that if all we have to look forward to is a kind of, you know, bare existence after this life, then I'd rather be on earth. But we Christians have something as St. Paul says, better than anyone can describe to you. Eye hasn't seen it, ear hasn't heard of it, hasn't even entered into our minds what God has prepared for those who love him. And that's why we need all these images of, you know, a bride adorned for her husband, God dwelling with his people, a city that doesn't even need natural light because God himself illumines it. Yes. I, to, to, I mean, I think really, you can, correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but I think Scripture's even giving the, some of these images of supreme yet passing joys in this life to show that the the surpassing joy of heaven which which never ends 
So, the joy of a husband and wife on their wedding day, the, the joy that they share is going to be followed by hardship. And after some period of time, the sensible joy passes away. This is actually part of making us capable of, of loving each other with, with a greater purity because I'm loving you because, because you are good. Like, you are, you are worth loving. But in heaven, there's that joy. And that is surpassing um, what, it, what we experience in this world. Only while it is surpassing, it is not passing. It doesn't right. end. And, and that's, that's the real quality. That the, the fathers of the church kind of worked out these questions. You know, would, would anything be good if it passes away? And in the end, no. Um, this actually will bring us to a question we're going to address in a, in a future episode about, well, then what is the point of our life on this earth? And if if the things of this earth, if the, if the good things pass away, then in the end they don't really have a point, right? Um, this is actually what Ecclesiastes is talking about from the other direction when he says, you know, you eat and then you get hungry again. You know, you, you store up wealth and then you have to spend it. You, you, you know, you live a long life but then you die at the end of it. What's the point of it all, right? Vanity of vanities is his conclusion because he doesn't have access to the resurrection yet. He doesn't have access to this final consummation. But we do. We, we know it. And of course, Ecclesiastes, you know, was a faithful man and he was looking forward. He just didn't know what the forward was yet. Um, so we recognize the, the great goodness. And as you pointed out, you know, to, to give us some idea of what these things are like, the sacred author um, uses the image of the greatest goods we have are here on this earth. So there can be a confusion when, for example, um, following the teaching of Christ, Christian preachers remind uh, the Christian faithful that marriage doesn't exist in heaven, right? Marriage passes away, or marriage is a natural good. That's true. That's not meant to diminish marriage. It's meant to point out that if marriage, which is so good, is only a natural good, imagine how much there must be in the supernatural order, what God has prepared for those who love him. It's, as I say, it's not meant to diminish marriage. It's meant to take the very best thing we have and use that as the, there must be something infinitely better than that in heaven. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, and maybe just because some people, because it hasn't been taught very clearly, if some of you are hearing that for the first time, like it's good to, I think, maybe as a caveat, just to know, in heaven you will love the person who is your spouse in this world more perfectly, not less. Right. You're going to have, the way I try to describe it to people when they have this question is, I'm supposed to have charity for everyone even here on earth, right? My charity will be perfected in heaven. I'm not going to ever lack or ever fail in charity in heaven. Okay, I'm supposed to have charity. I'm supposed to have charity for, if I'm married, for my spouse, right? I'm also supposed to have charity for the TSA agent at the airport, right? That looks different, right? Even here on this earth, it looks different. So the perfect relationships we're going to have in heaven, even in heaven, there's going to be differentiation. We're not all going to be just kind of molded into this big pot of, you know, homogeneous soup, right? Right. We're, we're supposed to have unique relationships, but they're going to be relationships that are perfected, right? So the married relationship will be perfected in heaven. Yes, yes. So all of our particular paths uh, to sainthood will not be forgotten. They'll be most fully appreciated with their full importance, their full ramifications, because at the end, with this judgment uh, giving way, we get to celebrate the entire plan of God's uh, salvation history unfolded. Uh, and just kind of, because we're talking about this perfection of charity, well, this is part of the perfection of the, that society in heaven. Um, you don't have criminals. You don't have people who um, you will even not like. Um, and you yourself will be entirely lovable. And it's, it's not because, well, finally everyone is acting the way I think they should. It, it's actually because my will is so perfectly united to God's, and so is his, and so is hers, so that everyone wants the same thing because they all want what God wants for each and, and every person right. there, angels and right. men and women. Yeah, the, this is a useful meditation, useful image, because it can help you to more earnestly desire those things, right? We are already here supposed to be working for the kingdom of God, right? Jesus says the kingdom of God is among you. He says, go and tell them the, king of God, the kingdom of God is at hand, right? So we're not looking forward to heaven as if 
it's some mere escape from the travails of this earth. Although it is. It is an escape from the travails of this earth. But we are supposed to be working for the kingdom of God here. Now, neither are we supposed to think that we can turn earth into heaven, right? That leads to utopianism and all manner of evils. Yes. That's maybe a topic for another episode. But we are supposed to be living already according to the law of charity, right? Jesus says um, that the law of God is summed up in love God and love neighbor. Um, St. Paul says, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law of God, right? Now, that's hard. We need to strive for that. We need to practice it. We need to get better at it. And we're not going to be perfect at it here. Even the saints um, weren't yet perfect at it here. Um, but we should be striving for that and thinking about how good, and as you described, that per perfect relationship with everyone that we're going to have in heaven, that can begin here. Now, speaking of then, what begins here and that perfection that will be in heaven, we still often have this gap at the time that we are called for, from this world uh, into the great unknown, although it is known by faith to, in these veiled images. So um, when Christ says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and yet at the moment of someone's death, if they are not yet perfected, uh, this, this requires a time to finish that perfection, correct? That's right. Um, that's what we mean by purgatory. Um, purgatory has two aspects. The one is to bring about this perfection of soul, which for any of us, we wouldn't expect that we have been perfected on earth. It is also a time um, to render justice to God. God must be rendered justice. If there would be any injustice left over at the end of our lives, then how could we go to heaven? We're unjust toward God, right? It's, maybe if I may put that another way, if I love God perfectly and there is something that I have offended him by in my life that I have not yet made amends for, I don't want to go before him without that being made up first. Right. So purgatory is an opportunity to accomplish both of these things, the perfection of the soul and the rendering of justice. Um, the rendering of justice is usually done by suffering, right? Um, it's by a payment of some kind, right? Not a payment uh, to as if we could offer God anything he doesn't already have, but a full cooperation, a willing cooperation in his work of saving my soul. Um, Jesus died for me, and I am willing to cooperate with that perfect gift of self. Actually, to harken back to an image I gave earlier, husband and wife, when the initial consolations uh, pass away from, from marriage, um, they love each other more perfectly by still doing what's right during the times of of a certain dryness or a, a time of carrying a cross, um, that actually shows the love of the other. Uh, so it's, it's a similar principle here uh, with the, the church suffering. Right. So um, now there's a certain objection that, well, can't God just accomplish that? He can accomplish the perfection of our souls instantaneously. If that were the only reason that purgatory exists, then it wouldn't exist. Um, God can do that instantaneously. We cannot render justice to God instantaneously. So that's why there are the two um, reasons for um, purgatory's existence and our, our kind of fulfillment of, of that time. However, at the end, when Christ returns, um, when Christ reveals, manifests himself to the whole world and consummates all things, right? Everything will be um, judged by fire, right? Um, when that happens, there will be no more church militant because there won't be an earth anymore. There will also no longer be a church suffering because there, everyone will go to the general judgment and there will be no more need for justice to be rendered. It will have all been fulfilled. Now, how that works, how the relationship of time and purgatory relates to time on earth, we don't exactly know. Um, but at the end of all things, when Christ reveals himself and he said he's going to come, he says he's going to reveal himself like lightning lights up the sky. We're all going to see him at once. Um, St. Paul gives us several descriptions of what, what is going to happen at that time. Um, he says that the, those who have uh, fallen asleep will rise first, right? And we will meet them in the air, right? Um, we will be with Christ, he says in, in 1 Thessalonians. There are many other descriptions. St. Yes. Peter gives certain descriptions. Um, however it happens, we're all going to see the final revelation of God. Um, the, the full, everyone's going to acknowledge him right? Um, but those who have not chosen to acknowledge him up to that point are going to acknowledge him as perfectly just, and they are going to bewail their failure to serve him. As we've heard in, uh, in the gospel, 
uh, where they are cast out into the outer darkness where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's, it's, uh, it is that I recognize now that God is just in what I am receiving. Right. The knees of all will bend before him, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, right? Every tongue will proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will be admitted to the kingdom, right? So even those in hell will glorify God, but they will glorify him by their sufferings, right? By their sufferings, which acknowledge that he is just, right? And he deserves to be rendered justice, which is why we should strive to be on his side here on this earth, to be ready for his coming. And this um, thought of hell can motivate us, but as I've said before uh, several times, the thought of heaven motivates us even more than the thought of hell. We want to love God because of his goodness, and not because of fear of punishment. We want to move from um, this kind of fear of punishment to love of God in his perfection.